I'm rooting for the crocodile. I hope he swallows your friends whole. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is the 15th episode of season seven, and we are watching Lake Placid as part of our series on killer animals. As Mel mentioned, we are talking about the 1999 horror comedy, Lake Placid. Now, we've been talking about killer animals. We've talked about Cujo. We've talked about Jaws a lot on this podcast. Um, And as we were talking about some of the kind of classic killer animal movies, this was when we were planning for the series and we were talking about like Cujo and Anaconda and Arachnophobia and all those type of movies. Matt mentioned Lake Placid. Now he can't join us for this episode, Matt. We definitely miss you, but we thought we'd take advantage because Mel and I both somehow missed Lake Placid in the 90s. So this was a first viewing for both of us. And I have to say, this is an interesting movie. It's an interesting entry into the killer animal genre. So I'm going to go over a little bit of kind of the facts about the movie. And then we're just going to talk about this wild, wild time. (laughs) Um, All right. The tagline for this movie is you'll never know what bit you. I think that's great. It was written by David E. Kelly. Of course, that name was huge in the 80s and 90s, especially on TV. So you had Boston Legal, Ali McBeal, Chicago Hope, Doogie Howser, MD. It was directed by Steve Miner, who has directed a lot of things, kind of like Kelly has written a lot of things. But I think pertinent to our podcast, he directed some of the Friday the 13th sequels. So I I kind of wanted to throw out that connection as well. The movie stars Bill Pullman, Bridget Fonda, Oliver Platt, Mariska Hargitay, Brendan Gleeson, and surprise to me, Betty White. It also spawned five low-budget made-for-TV movies I haven't heard too much good things about the sequels to this movie. So I don't know. This may be the only Lake Placid that I watch, but who can really tell? Um, Yeah, this movie was an interesting movie for me. I think Betty White might have been the highlight for me. But Mel, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on Lake Placid. Well, I think, you know, right before we hit record, we were kind of talking about our overall thoughts and I was entertained. I would, I think I would watch this again. I think it's a pretty good creature feature. Um, Was everything perfect or great about it? No. Um, You know, watching this now in 2023, uh, I had kind of forgotten how kind of uh, cringy and uh, uncomfortable some of the kind of stereotypes or the jokes that were in the movie were. This is a movie that came out in 1999, listeners. Um, but I I have to say some of the humor in it seemed very tongue-in-cheek to me and like aware of what the movie was doing. Um, I, I don't have any specific examples off the top of my head, except maybe the explanation that the lake was supposed to be called Lake Placid, but actually wasn't. It's called Black Lake because the water is so dark or something like that. Um, there would be characters who would just kind of ask questions that I was thinking as a viewer of this oddness. Um, and sometimes I think the kind of heavy hand on the manipulation of some of the relationships, just almost playing with tropes of these kind of movies. So, you know, that makes it seem like, uh, that makes it seem, I guess, like I'm 
I was very thoughtful about this movie and I mainly was just laughing the whole time. Um, I agree that Betty White, I think Betty White might have been the best part of this movie. Um, the joke about PETA at one point made me chuckle where they were like, I, you know, PETA would be interested in knowing how you treat your cows. Um, it seemed to foreshadow a little bit, maybe her later turn on Boston Legal. Um, I watched that show as well. And, you know, the mention of the, let's just say a skillet problem, um, per se, for people who are not familiar with either the movie or the show yet. And there were just so many quotes, like the one we opened up with, or the one where the, I guess, one of our main characters uh, was screaming because a severed head had come out at her and she screams it's the second time I've been hit with a severed head and it upsets me and that just kind of tickled me so yeah the the awareness of what the movie was doing I think um was interesting to me um one more thing before I throw it back to you Lisa for your impressions and we can start talking is the influences I think you can see on this from other creature features the the beginning scene where the diver is being pulled by the crocodile and ran kind of almost into the boat and the guy's got to pull him into the boat remind me a bit of that super intense scene, Lisa, that you and I discussed when we watched Jaws 2 with the, the couple, the teens who left the teen flotilla group and got attacked. And I think we talked about how disturbing it was that the shark kept kind of ramming him into the boat. I believe that was Jaws 2. And I immediately thought of that. And then of course, with like the severed head stuff and there were just kind of little, uh, little moments and gestures, uh, helicopter, all this kind of stuff uh, to these sorts of, these sorts of films. And as a person who was familiar with those sorts of films and those tropes, that also tickled me. Uh, Lisa, what were, what were some of your thoughts? I, I know from looking at your notes, we agree on a lot of stuff, but I'm curious what you thought watching this for the first time. Oh, yeah. Um, well, honestly, I didn't know what to expect with this movie. I, before we started talking about it, honestly, I don't think I could have even told you that this was a movie about a killer crocodile. I, I didn't even know that that was what it was. I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I had a hard time, honestly, separating Lake Placid from C Cape Fear, which are two completely different movies. And they, they came out like eight years apart. So I don't know why in my head they got jumbled up that way. I definitely have seen Cape Fear multiple times. And I hadn't seen Lake Placid, but I, I think... In my head, I thought Lake Placid was a kind of knockoff Cape Fear. So I thought it was going to be more of like a psychological thriller type movie than a horror comedy because it definitely fits in a horror comedy genre. Like when we watched Anaconda, which was a rewatch for us, but when I watched that movie again, it struck me at, at how it was, it was kind of flirting with B-movie status, but I don't think it was meant to be a horror comedy in the same way that this movie was. Like this movie was really trying to land both the horror and the comedy and like mix those two moments. So I don't know. I, I was really surprised by what this movie was. Um, I was also surprised by the amount of people who were in this movie. I, I mentioned Betty White, who I'm sure we'll talk about. Brendan Gleeson was in this movie. And honestly, I hadn't seen him. I don't remember seeing him in anything from the 90s. Um, I mean, I guess he was in Braveheart. But I, I don't often think about him with that most of the time. When I think, I mean, of course, like, you know, Harry Potter or something, but um, yeah, I just uh, was really kind of surprised to see him in this role and to feel like he was kind of underutilized, honestly, like he played the kind of bumbling local sheriff, like he was the local law enforcement. And I'm so used to seeing him. One of my favorite things listeners, <laughs> uh, really of all times. One of my favorite TV shows is Mr. Mercedes. I adored 
the Stephen King like trilogy or, or I guess now that he's adding on to to that book series but the Bill Hodges character I love and he brought that character to life in such a fun way and he's just so talented that honestly I was a little surprised to see him in this role because it was so different it was so different so I was a little bit surprised but to see him in this a few things I kind of want to point out before we really get into the discussion of this I thought that Bridget Fonda's character was very oddly placed in this movie I I really couldn't understand why they had called in the museum paleontologist from New York <laughs> to come in. I mean, I know that I guess they explained it in some sort of way and it kind of ended up being a joke that like she was there with the sheriff and fish and game officer because they were both kind of looking at her like, why are you here? Which I, you know, but I kind of felt that too. So I was surprised to see that dynamic. It, especially after something like Anaconda, because the whole premise of like a film crew out on, you know, the Amazon made sense to me much more than like why she was there. And they played it up for comedy in a way that was a bit odd to me too. I'll just go ahead and say this and put this as like a, an asterisk on this whole episode. Listeners, if you haven't seen this movie, if you're like Mel and me and, and it just it was one you just missed for whatever reason. The humor in this movie is very odd. It's borderline offensive in places because it's it's a very 90s movie. And I think that was jarring to go back and rewatch it. When you've seen something that you like, when you rewatch something that you saw in the 90s and it, and you remember how it felt to watch it, sometimes that feels different. And this like, lens of nostalgia can gloss over some of those things that are not okay today but when you haven't seen a movie and I think you go back and and you go to watch it for the first time but it's like 24 years after the fact or 23 or however I don't know what is math I don't know but when you go back to look at that like there was so much humor that was like directed towards her character that was that felt very like sexist even like borderline misogynistic there was fat shaming there was uncomfortable jokes about like the gay and queer community so yeah i think we should just put that i know it was a 90s movie and to some degree that was just par for the course i'm not excusing it at all but i i do think we need to put that like kind of asterisk there because This movie did try to like go in hard on the comedy aspect of it. And I don't know if it was always successful, but then again, we're watching it for the first time. I don't know how I would feel if I saw this in the nineties and then this was like a nostalgia watch for me. I don't know. How do you feel about that Mel? Yeah, I I agree with what you're saying. Um, I, yeah, I think that, I mean, I like the way you articulated it. You know, my my thoughts on it that I was saying in the notes were that it, it made me kind of cringe a little bit watching it now. And like, I can't go back and know how it would have been watching the 90s. But I know like now when I watch movies from the 90s, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't remember that. Or that's weird, uh, you know, kind of thing or looking back on that. But I do think you're right. Like if you have a frame of nostalgia, then you can remember like watching it and enjoying it for what it was then and seeing it now. But since we're just watching this now uh, for the first time, I think we're bringing our, I won't say how old we are, but our much older selves. You know, if I had watched it in the, in 1999, I would have been like just out of high school. <laughs> like I would have been midway through college. So my thoughts and the milieu that I was in and the movies I was seeing and the things that were on TV would have been that time period. But now in 2023, uh, much later, um, time has passed. And I'm now myself at this age with all the knowledge that I have from then looking back on it. And I feel like you're right. Without the nostalgia buffer, without remembering what it would have been like as a college student seeing this movie, those parts were really jarring. And 
it like I said earlier, it was like the homages and the creature feature parts um, and Betty White's parts that really kind of entertained me. Like any time the men were talking to um, what's her name, Bridget Fonda's character. Uh, I think her name was Kelly. Uh, see, that's the thing. It's hard to even remember. When I think of them, I think of Bill Pullman's character, you know, Oliver Platt's character. It was hard for me to fall into it and really believe they were who they were. I felt like they were playing parts. And I feel like the second half of the movie or maybe the last last bit of it played the best for me because they were over all the forcing them into these really like uncomfortable repartee that I guess they thought was sexual tension or something but was not working for me but i just kind of felt like it was too aware of itself which was causing the jokes to kind of break if that makes sense but i think you're right it's also the the years that have passed and the time change i think you may want to jump in on that too but that's fine i had more um I found it easier to understand why our character Kelly was there, even though I also believe with you that it was dubious than Oliver Platt's character, who, Hector, who was only there because I guess he's like a rich playboy mythology professor. Like I was completely flummoxed as to how a mythology professor would be obsessed with diving with crocodiles. And his character was crazy. I think his character was meant to be crazy. But I just had, I mean, that would be like if someone discovered a 30 foot crocodile and you and I showed up because we were like, we're literature professors <laughs> or we've read a lot of horror stuff or like creature feature movies. I don't, that I was like, okay, scientist who knows the history of crocodiles back to the time of the dinosaurs. Okay. This dude, I'm not so sure about. So I don't know. There's a lot that tested my ability to suspend my disbelief in this movie. Yeah, he was the other character that I felt really thrown off by because his whole character was, I just like to do daredevil things like jump in waters with crocodiles, but also sleep with women. And I guess I w it was easier for me to accept his character because I knew this was a 90s movie and we had just watched Anaconda and he felt a bit like a caricature of the Owen Wilson character in Anaconda. Like it was that character who was just kind of there for a fun time and to party and, you know, to maybe have some romantic relationships. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> euphemistically. I feel like he's a mix of him and the horrible John Voight character. Yes, he did feel that way. Like, he felt, yeah. But, but almost to me, I thought, are they actively trying, like, are the filmmakers actively trying to parody that particular style? Or are they just playing it up for comedy? Like I couldn't, that's what I couldn't figure out is how much of this movie was meant to be a parody of the genre and how much of it was just, we're going to make these like larger than life characters so that people laugh because I don't think it was meant to be a parody. I'm not sure what it was meant to be though, right? I mean, <laughs> like just watching it. <laughs> a giant crocodile movie. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I mean, every um, character was eccentric and bigger than what they should have been, and nothing was motivated. The only person who seemed realistic and had motivation was Betty White. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about Betty White, because I've mentioned that I think she is what saved this movie for me. Like, honestly, if she had not been in this movie, this would have been a complete, just forgettable movie. But Betty White's character is so funny. She plays this woman who lives out on the lake. And one thing I found really interesting, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, but this, I, I, I thought, I, it's hard for me to see these kind of movies and not think about Jaws, right? Because it's a small town trying to fight this larger than life animal that's attacking people obviously this is an animal in the water this is a crocodile that 
kind of like Jaws being the shark that's not acting like a normal shark. You know, this is, they're not used to this. And there was this small town law enforcement with, with Brendan Gleason's character. And you kind of had, instead of the sheriff, like butting up with the mayor of the town, there was the, you know, the kind of fish and game aspect of it. That's like, you know, that they're, they're butting heads one thing that I was surprised with this movie, because I was seeing so much of the Jaws influence, that they didn't have the idea of, oh, no, we're about to open this lake for the summer and tons of people are going to be eaten by this crocodile. They actually mentioned several times that nobody really lives on the lake except this, there's this like old woman and it's Betty White and she seems very sweet when they come over and you're introduced to her character like you see her in her house and I think she like lays out like coffee and cookies for them and you know she's just she just seems like this really sweet old lady I mean you know Betty White has like the most angelic face I think I've ever seen on somebody like she just looks like and that's part of what has always made her funny is because she will say the most unexpected things. And when you see it, because she seems so sweet that when she says something that's like darkly funny (laughs) or sardonic or whatever, it sarcastic, it it just, it hits all the more. And in this case, you start finding out these things about her, like her husband is dead. And you find out that like she killed him apparently, you know, because they ask her like, you know, oh, did you, kill your husband she's like yeah I did you know um and then again not to like fast forward too much to the end of this movie but we're gonna have to talk about it since we're talking about her you find out that basically she's been keeping this crocodile alive to the point that like she's not only been feeding it and I guess growing it so big uh but she knows that it's dangerous and she actively has not called for help from like the fish and game department or from law enforcement because she says that this lake belongs to the crocodile. Like it's his lake now, I think is how she puts it. And so I don't know. I thought that that was kind of an interesting thing because she almost in a way ends up being the villain of the movie. (laughs) Maybe more so than like the mayor is in Jaws because she's not only just like willfully ignoring something, but she's actively trying to keep this monster alive. And, and she just says some of the most unhinged things. Like she's got some of the funniest lines in this whole movie. So if for nothing else, if you haven't seen it, just knowing that it doesn't always hit its mark, that her part is pitch perfect. I agree. I actually rewound kind of all her scenes <laughs> of watching them again because I was just so entertained. Not watch it like I would watch it and then kind of go back and be like, oh my gosh, did she say that? That was good. And yeah. I think you're right. She has <laughs> and bear in mind, I'm not saying that this is a you know Academy Award worthy or anything, but she has motivations and she stays on the side of the crocodile the whole time. Whereas, um, you're right, otherwise there's no clock on this. There's no tourists coming. There's no kids coming to hang out over the summer. There's no people who live on the lake other than this woman and her husband who was killed by the crocodile by accident because the crocodile liked them because they feed it regularly for years. Years this crocodile has been there, not hurt anybody. It's only when law enforcement and fish and wildlife start going in and doing things they haven't done before in the lake that they encounter it. And so I agree with you. Uh, Like Anaconda, the clock on stuff that was happening was not really there until they call the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And all of a sudden it's like they're going to come kill it, which, of course, the Betty White character doesn't like. Then, again, you have mixed motivations, I thought, because I was attempting to take notes on this movie. I was trying uh, in quotation marks. But they go back and forth about what they want to do with it. And like all of a sudden there's like this impassioned plea to save this animal that's probably over 150 years old and swim across the ocean or whatever. And I was, I was totally confused as to 
almost as a who was making what argument. There was a lot of just kind of uh, jumbled things happening and motivations. And if you didn't pay really close attention to when they would randomly say something about how many hours would it be till fish and wildlife was coming or weren't coming, there really wasn't a load of suspense in this movie. But I do think that, like I said earlier, Betty White's character was delightful and had the clearest kind of, I guess you would say, characterization of anybody in the movie, if that makes sense, because she never really shifted or waffled from what she was doing, which was her protection of the crocodile. I mean, I don't even know what's evil in this movie because the crocodile just showed up and needed things to eat and her and her husband were taking care of it as a pet and it never really seemed to bother anybody, I guess. there. Yeah, you're right. There was no intense, inciting incident that made us feel like we're not going after it like we were in Anaconda for a person who's going to pay us a lot of money for it. We're not exploring it all. It's just some random thing that happened that people stumbled on and they weren't even sure what they were supposed to be doing about it. I know I'm kind of trailing off there, but that's just, how do you even explain what's going on in the movie? Because everything is changing constantly or doesn't really have kind of support for why it's happening. And I know people are probably like, well, why did Mel say earlier she would watch this again? I watch a lot of movies that are like so bad they're funny. Like I'm never going to watch Sharks of the Corn again, <laughs> but I think I can stand watching Lake Placid mainly because of Betty White. <laughs> Nobody needs to watch Sharks of the Corn. <laughs> um, but not yes, even I, the first time, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> not even the first time. Absolutely. Yeah, I I agree that if nothing else watch this movie just for Betty White's character because I, I don't know how else to say it, but she she is delightful. I I loved watching everybody else. Their characters kind of felt strange to me. I think just because I have seen them in so much many other things and these this felt I don't know, a lot of the characters felt like kind of stock characters that I would recognize and didn't have that much to connect with that was different about this movie. But she very much, I think, stood out. Um, I was looking just to see how everybody else felt about this movie, everybody else being, I guess, critics. And um, Rotten Tomatoes, I think, gave this a 47%. But one reviewer said, Betty White's delightful supporting turn may be worth the price of admission alone, but Lake Placid is swamped by a smarmy script and inability to deliver on the creature feature mayhem. I would kind of agree with that. Um, the... When you compare, but again, I don't want to compare it with something that is too contemporary because I keep thinking of movies like Cocaine Bear, which is a killer animal and it's a horror comedy. And that delivered so much more on both the horror and comedy fronts, for me at least. But I know that there's decades in between those two movies, so it's not really fair to compare them. Um, Roger Ebert said <laughs> that it was completely wrong headed from beginning to end and put it on his list of 10 worst films of the year. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, but I do agree with this empire review where he gave it four out of five stars and said, you can enjoy Placid as a straightforward camping holiday nightmare or as a sly ironic take on the same. It works deliciously as both. This movie is not particularly smart but it's fun. And I think it hits the same thing that a lot of these movies hit. Like Anaconda, I would certainly put in this category where if you wanted to get together with a group of friends and watch this and kind of have a goof off night, then this is a great movie to do that with. And I think probably the majority of that is being held up by Betty White. Again, just my opinion, but I do think that this is something that I don't know if I would call it so bad it's good. I don't even know if I would call this necessarily a B-horror movie, but it can definitely be enjoyed in the same vein as those type of films. Oh, yeah. And I think the fact that you feel like they're all playing roles <clears throat> plays into that, too. I, I don't think 
I mean, I don't know with 100% certainty, but this is not a movie that feels like they were taking it super seriously. It seems like a movie they were having fun with. And I, the fact that they they had Betty White in it, I think, points to that, too. I think that aspect maybe makes it a little bit different from some of the other creature features. But I agree with you. Like, seeing this, if you just want to watch something just fun and silly go for it like a popcorn film or if you want to watch this with a group of friends yes one thing i do think we need to talk about a little bit is we talked about the special effects in (laughs) such as they were in anaconda and i thought now i'm not saying this is 1999 and it's a movie about an attacking 30 foot crocodile that couldn't possibly be in this area of maine i wouldn't think i don't know maybe that could be but <clears throat> I felt like, again, like a Jaws throwback, that the fact that the crocodile was mainly in the water worked to the advantage of the creature kind of horror, such as it was in this movie. In a way where we talked about with Anaconda, when the snake would come out of the water, you had to really like just go with it and have fun with the movie. I'm not saying the crocodile special effects are like uber believable. What I'm saying is I feel like, again, that idea of hiding the thing, having it scaring the fish and making them flap and having stuff pop out when you think the crocodile's there and it's not and showing it's just head above water. I felt like that was way more effective. Um, then when the crocodile actually comes out on land at the end, I was okay with it because it was the end and stuff like that's supposed to be happening. But it did, again, like Anaconda, the sizes of the crocodile, I felt like were being played with in ways like it looked like it was gargantuan on the land whereas it maybe didn't in the water easy issues to have in the 90s with special effects or depending upon your budget even now lisa what did you think about the idea of like the crocodile being a little bit more believable i guess you would say or menacing whatever because it's mainly in the water like jaws i liked that aspect of it honestly i liked that it wasn't because anaconda for me, like snakes are such a scary thing. I mean, they don't bother me as much as spiders, if I'm being honest. Like I just have, I think, a true phobia of spiders. Um, they just creep me out. Uh, I know I, they shouldn't because not all of them are harmful. And I understand that there are benefits to them. I can handle a snake. I don't want to get up close to one. And the idea of a big snake that is out there and could harm me you know that that does scare me but at some point in anaconda it did get so big and so large and so kind of ridiculous that it almost was like laughable at that point um it it wasn't even acting like a snake at at certain points this and even though yes jaws does not act like a, a real shark we know that but it still is scary it is scary to see kind of like to know that there's something below the water that is hunting you and i do think that this was one of this another one of the strengths of this movie was that the crocodile when it did when it was kind of acting as the hunter under the water, it was scary. Like there were a few times where people would fall into the water and there was that moment of kind of being like, ah, are, is something going to happen? Are they going to get pulled under? Are they, you know, there was that kind of terror of you can't see what's below the water. So I do think that that was affected that they didn't show too much. One part that I really remember is when they were trying to, get it kind of towards the end and they were going to bait it with, I think it was with the cow and they had the cow brought in uh, by helicopter and they were kind of lowering it in and they had made the joke that, Oh, this is, she's floating like a giant tea bag, which I did kind of find darkly funny. Like when the, when the film leaned into that dark humor, which I think Betty White's character did so well, it was really funny. I thought, um, but when the when they were like waiting for it and it was under the water i was i was tense in those moments but then when it started kind of acting towards the end where it was just like pulling the the helicopter and all that kind of stuff then i started feeling like oh okay it's 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 starting to become unbelievable but for the most part i did find it scary and i found myself wishing that they would play into that more in the way jaws did but i think because they were trying to do both like make it scary and funny that sometimes they didn't focus on the scares enough 
Yeah, I agree. I think they were kind of walking a fine line there. I will say one of the scenes that probably is like unrealistic <clears throat> was when the they first saw the crocodile kind of for real when it came out of the water and grabbed the bear that was attacking them. And for me, even though that was one of those moments that was starting to test the idea of hiding the monster, I liked the glimpse of its head. Like, you know, that that's a when you're watching a nature program about crocodiles, that is the that moment, that hunting moment where they come out of nowhere and grab the thing on the shore, which is also one of the horrors, I think, of those animals is that you or a dog or an animal or something, a wildebeest could be like on the shore and then all of a sudden you're gone. And that it did that to a black bear. I thought that was effective um, in in heightening the tension and showing them what they were up up against at that point. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think they were always walking a line between do we show too much? How do we do this? At the end, I think they were just all in on the fact that they were trying to be a, a intense creature feature and just kind of let it go with whatever they could do. Um, and of course, at the end, you know, you have two, I think we could probably go ahead and talk about this a little bit. We have two ways it's open-ended. We find out there was a mate. It was a couple that, that Betty White's character had been taking care of, Mrs. Bickerman. And they kill the one while the other one is tranked and caught in the helicopter. Because I thought that was interesting, too, when they think everything's done and the second one just comes out of nowhere. Um, again, hiding under the water. And so we see at the end, you know, at the very, very end during the credits, that the large one that was trapped and, and tranquilized is being taken to Portland on a basically like a tractor trailer to be put in a tank while they decide what to do with it, him or her. Um, and the other aspect of the end is that you have Betty White taking food to the babies of these this pair. So obviously, like you said, there were multiple movies after this, um, which I think we even talked about how they had the Lake Placid Crocodile like tag teaming some creatures when we talked about Anaconda with Matt. Um, but they left it open ended so that you could not only have um, other crocodiles in the water they didn't know about, but you could also have the big one escape. Um, and you could also um, have the babies grow up. So I think they they were definitely aiming toward, <laughs> toward coming back, as a lot of the great creature features do. The possibility for escape and sequels abound, um, <laughs> and they were definitely open to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I liked the ending of it. I thought it was kind of a, a fun twist that after everything Betty White's character still has not learned her lesson and she's just intent on on keeping this lake <laughs> um the crocodiles going because she's feeding all the little babies uh, I, I really liked that that was a lot of fun and, and you're right I, I think for this particular type of film it has to spawn sequels and that was the perfect way to do it out of the five sequels, you know, like, I don't know if I could ever really watch any of them. It seems like because they were the made for TV, it looks like a lot of them were on sci-fi. So I think they really leaned into that B-movie kind of Roger Corman style of film, especially when he did all the shark, when he did those shark movies, um, the, the shark exploitation movies of like the aughts, I guess, is, is when a lot of his came out. But um, it, it seems like it, it's in that vein of we're going to have like some party girls in bikinis swim in Lake Placid and get eaten by man-eating crocodiles. And that's the the gist of the movie. There was that Lake Placid versus Anaconda, which you mentioned, which came out in um, 2015. I I don't know if that's worth watching at all although i do see that robert england who played freddy krueger in the nightmare on elm street film series uh is in that so i'm a little bit curious <laughs> to know what happens there and corin nimick is also in it he was in some of those shark exploitation films that we mentioned so you know, there is some kind of crossover for this type of, of film, which is kind of interesting. He was in Sand Sharks. That was the one I was trying to remember, uh, which came out in 2012. So, yeah, 
uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be in a, in a real big rush to watch these movies, but it's a thing. It exists. And this one has Betty White in it. And that's about the best thing I can say. <laughs> All right. Well, I feel like we have covered Lake Placid about as well as we can. So if you have watched this film, or better yet, if you have watched any of the sequels, you know what, let us know, because I would love to know if any of them are must-sees, um, because maybe I will add them to our list if people tell me that there is something worthwhile in them. If you've seen them and you want to reach out to us, we are at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram. We also have a Facebook page, so feel free to drop us a note and let us know what you think if you love what we're doing. Consider supporting us on Patreon or simply rate and review us, which is entirely free, but it does help other listeners find us. The music by Nicholas Gasparini. We will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode. <laughs>